Well, hello and welcome to my first book review about The Bottom Billion. That is the book I've been reading for the last few, uh, well, months and weeks, basically. I have read it before, um, but I've been rereading it uh, for this uh, book review, at least the parts that I um, uh, thought were very insightful, which, um, to be honest, it's really hard to point out what is really insightful, uh, because it, it more or less pushes you to say well other things are less insightful well this is not one of those books this this book is good from cover to cover it is a um, a very interesting book and I've, I've really learned a lot from it so uh well let's uh, dive right in uh, right into it um this is my first book review so it might be a little uh a little strange uh, <laughs> At least for me, it's a new uh, it's a new thing. So let me know in the comments what you think about uh, how I do this book review. If you have any tips or tricks for me, I greatly appreciate it. But uh, hey, let's uh, let's get started. Professor Sir Paul Collier, he was the director of the Development Research Group of the World Bank for years. Um, he is now. Uh, doing loads of uh, research into well all different um, uh, subjects and all through this book and and also through his other books um, you can see that he's continuously pointing to research that he's done but at the same time the book itself um, though you can you can really see that it has been researched thoroughly before he actually r wrote the book uh, it, it doesn't look uh, it, it doesn't read like it's a uh, um, uh, well, just just any any research thing, you know, it's it's it, it is pretty easy. Well, it's not a really easy book, but it is easier to read than just a, um, a review on research. It, it's not that. So um, that that is that, that is very very interesting and really good quality. It's uh, it's something um, that I really like. Um, but he's he's done re several um, uh, research uh, things, uh, research topics. He's been uh, researching into his uh, governance in low-income countries, especially the political economy of democracy, which is one of the books I'm reading about now, Wars, Guns and Democracy. It's uh, by this writer as well, so that, that will be the next uh, book review. Economic Growth in Africa, Economics of Civil War, AIDS, Globalization and Poverty, and The Greed versus Grievance, debate in international relations he um, has been appointed commander of the order of the british empire in 2008 and knighted in the 2014 new year's honors for services to promoting research and policy change in africa um, he's been awarded the president's medal by the british academy for his pioneering contribution in bringing ideas from research into policy within the field of african economics and uh, in july 2017 he was elected a fellow of the british academy uh, the united kingdom's national academy for the humanities and social sciences so um well you know he has earned some um some recognition and some rewards for his uh, for his research and and really if you if you read through this book and his other books you can really see that you're dealing with a brilliant man if i say so myself so um anyway we're not here to talk about the man himself though it, it probably you know you could tell a lot more about this man but we're talk here to talk about his book so the bottom billion is uh, focusing on um uh, well, the poorest countries in the world, why the poorest countries are failing and what can be done about it. Um, the first part of the book is, is a preface with this title, Falling Behind and Falling Apart. And uh, in that he describes that, you know, there used to be, and, and I have this picture in my mind as well, there used to be one billion rich people in the world, or roughly one billion, and five billion, the other five billion were poor in the world. Well, that is not true anymore it's actually more like you know there's the top billion um rich people rich countries and uh just to uh just to be honest we in the western world we live in that in that segment um then there's four billion people that are um well they're, they're gaining track they're 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 continuously growing um and they can actually make a living for themselves so they they're not poor anymore 
they do earn enough money to um, maintain themselves and their families in a reasonable way. And their countries are actually stable enough as well to keep on growing and, and, and well, going. And then there's the bottom billion who are at the bottom, who are really poor, live in poor countries and, uh, well, they are struggling for survival. And uh, the first part, he's, he's actually painting a picture of these, these countries. And um, uh, though there are countries that are moving in and out of the bottom billion, there is not a lot of countries actually moving out from the bottom billion. Um, so you can really identify the problem that there is a big problem with these, these countries in the bottom billion and something has to be done about it. So uh, that was what this book is about. Then the, the second part of the book, he focuses on the different traps. Of course, the bottom billion, you know, I, I told you they are trapped in, at the bottom. What keeps them trapped? Well, the, he has identified four different traps. And uh, the second part of the book, uh, which is the, the first big part, because the first part is only the introduction to the, the concept of the bottom billion. The traps, that was a really interesting part of the book. I really got into the book in this part. The first one is the conflict trap. The conflicts uh, being uh, civil war, rebellion, um, a regular war between two countries, of course, uprising, uh, coups, um, and, and things like that. Um, and he just focuses on, well, one of the ways he, he, he says, you know, it is very bad for a country to be in a war. Um, he actually did some research on this uh, with others as well. Uh, the cost of war is enormous. It is a 2.3%, that's an average, uh, on economic growth reduction. And the average war lasts about seven years. So that's uh, a country that has been, uh, that could have been 15% richer if there were no war. And of course, you know, civil war and um, uh, especially civil war, but also rebellions, uprisings, coups, things like that, they tend to come back. The, the, there is a very, very big, big chance that within the first 10 years of a, uh, a conflict ending, um, the conflict will actually revert, uh, sorry, the country will actually revert to a conflict. Uh, and, and sometimes it's another conflict, you know, one civil war is followed by a rebellion of another group and, and so on and so forth. And of course, um, it takes several decades for a country to actually get free from, from, this, uh, uh, from this conflict. But if within a decade it actually reverts to a conflict, then it, it'll only take longer for it to, uh, to escape that trap. So, yeah, that really is a big problem. He actually found out, uh, and there's an amount in the book in, in, uh, in money, what, what a, uh, a conflict costs that economy. And that is that is huge. You know, of course, not all, everything is about money. There's there's people's lives involved, uh, which is way more important than the money. But at the same time, we're talking about poverty here. So the best way to explain it is in money. And these people, uh, well, they could have been much better off if there wasn't a conflict in their um, uh, in their society. And of course, there's different types of conflicts, and he's not talking about that because we in the Western world have conflicts as well, but we tend to solve them in a different way. And we, we tend to see a different way to solve the conflict. And I'm not trying to elevate us in the West here. We're doing it in a, in a, a different way. Uh, and, and let's be honest, it has taken us centuries to, uh, to get to the place where we are at the moment, especially here in, in Europe. But there is conflict brewing in Europe as well. Uh, left and right are are polarizing and there is conflict going, but still we find a solution in uh, just engaging in, well, in talks and, 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 and making, making sure that we, we talk about what, what, you know, what is wrong <laughs> and what, why we have a conflict and things like that. And most of the time we can solve the conflict um, without going to fight, uh, let alone into a civil war or a war. Though, you know, the last big war in Europe, well, not too long ago, especially in the bigger scale of things. Anyway, the next trap is the natu natural resource trap. Uh, natural resources um, like oil, diamonds and things like that. They don't just provide a lot of uh, money for a country. Um, you know what? That 
in itself it could be a very good thing happening to a country if it you know if a very poor country finds oil in its backyard then it might actually be that they can if they manage it right it could really be that that is what's going to get them out of poverty but a lot of the times uh, what happens is that it actually becomes a trap for them and why is that well because of Dutch disease. I'm Dutch myself, so I really, well, this 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 has opened my eyes for some things in, in our economy here in the Netherlands. But Dutch disease is is this. Um, you know, there's an import and export balance, um, as in, you know, there's a certain amount of money going out of the country uh, in which you purchase things from other countries. And there's an amount of money going into the country. Um, in which other countries actually purchase your goods. Well, if you have a certain um, a certain natural resource, and for the Dutch, with the Dutch disease, it's natural gas. We have gas all around, uh, in, in the bottom, well, below our ground here, and we're, we're drilling, um, we're, we're getting that gas up, and we have been selling that for, for centuries. Well, because we now have more goods, because we already have an economy that is exporting a lot of goods, and now we can uh, add gas to that. But it actually raises um, the amount of goods that we can push out. Because if, if you see uh, uh, gas as, as a good that we, we put out, um, then, then our import-export balance becomes, well, it becomes unbalanced. Uh, but there's only so much that we can purchase, you know, so, if, if it's unbalanced, what what happens a lot of time is that the prices and, and our uh, our econo economic value rises, which makes our exports a lot more expensive and um, other countries won't purchase them anymore. Plus, um, you know, if our economy becomes better, our, our prices become higher. And the thing is that other countries won't purchase our goods anymore. So there's less demand for our goods and it will actually hurt our industry and our um, our development our techn uh, technological development because if our industry is hurt because we can't export our goods anymore and other people aren't buying them because they're too expensive then of course there's less demand so we're not doing a lot in um, in technological research anymore because there's no demand anyway and it, it, can, it can actually hurt the technological development of a country. Um, next to that, there's also the resource control. You can see a lot of countries um, that you know are in a conflict, like um, at the moment Congo, um, but other countries uh, around the world as well. Um, and he points out a lot of these different uh, examples of other countries um, that have problems, not just because of the conflict, but also because of the natural resource. And there have been, uh, and, and still are, uh, you know, the thing about blood diamonds. Diamonds that are in the ground that are um, used by either a rebellion or a rebel leader. And are actually sold on the world market. And also might fuel a conflict. The control of these resources might fuel a, con a conflict. So these two might, at some point, work together. And that is really a recipe for a very big disaster. The third trap he uh, identifies is landlocked with bad neighbors. Well, uh, landlocked with bad neighbors. Let's say your your country is pretty stable, but your neighbor uh, neighboring country has a conflict. You are landlocked, so you don't have any any access to to the seas to to one of the ports. So it, it is really hard for you as a country to connect to uh, trade to global trade, and you are relying. Uh, on the, your neighbors to provide the uh, infrastructure. Um, so your goods get transported through another country uh, to, to reach the global markets. Well, if that country is in a conflict or actually has bad, uh, bad, bad, bad infrastructure, uh, structure, uh, then it, it'll become really hard for your country to access the global markets and therefore to to make a living for itself so um, that that is a big big problem and next to that 
you know, your country, if, if your country is in a uh, is in a conflict, it, it'll cost you. We just saw that with, with the, the conflict trap. But if as a neighbor, you get a spillover from the conflict as well, it actually hurts your economy if your neighbor is in a conflict. Of course, the effect is less, um, less significant, but it still is there and you can't do anything about it. But your country is going to hurt. So, um, well, that's that's the problem. If you're landlocked with bad neighbors, there's literally not, not a lot of ways you can get out of that. The last one is bad governance in a small country. Bad governance, let's be honest, it is always a problem. Whether you're a big country or a small country, bad governance always is a problem. But in a big country, a lot of the times there's ways around the system. In a small country, what you can see is bad governance uh, might actually erode all economic progress and might actually erode a lot of the chances you have to make a living for yourself because the small country is all controlled by by this government. Um, and in a small country, if, if there's a large enough government, the government can actually control everything you do. Um, so bad governance in a small country has a bigger effect on the economy and on poverty uh, and on your development, of course, than in a big country. Um, and he does a lot of um, uh, good work in, in explaining this as well. So the next part is an interlude, globalization to the rescue. Well, globalization, um, you know, it is a thing that is, it is happening. You know, the world is getting smaller and smaller because, you know, we actually get closer to each other. Not literally, of course, but travel times get smaller. Uh, the internet, um, has has connected people in a way that that hasn't been um, possible for before. Uh, so we actually communicate on a uh, much faster way than we used to uh, some years ago. Um, but globalization, of course, it also has an influence on trade. Um, globalization to the rescue. Well, the thing is, a lot of people that that. Um, are totally for a free market. They say globalization will actually get these countries going as well. Well, globalization, what you can see is, and that is what uh, Sir Paul uh, Collier uh, also um, uh, explains in this, in this chapter. The problem is there's only so much need for low income or, or sorry, for low wage countries. The way for a country to escape um, poverty was to start as a low wage or a low income, low cost country. So labor force that could actually produce goods very cheap for you. And then earn, getting that money, it could earn, uh, it could use the, proceeding, the proceeds for, from that to, to start developing a country, um, which has actually happened with India and China, which are still uh, considered uh, uh, countries where, where labor is cheap but they have been developing and, and started using, uh, started that way, you know, started being the cheap labor country and, and now they're developing and they, they are actually not in the bottom million anymore. But there's only so much countries that you can have as a cheap labor country. So there's, there's not really a way to connect to the global market anymore. If you are trapped in one of these four traps, it is going to be really hard to connect to the global market, even if you have uh, your own uh, connection in your own port. Um, it is still going to be very hard to connect to the globalization because, you know, we, the other five million, we're actually going up or let's say, uh, let's do it the other way. We're going up, up, up that way. Yeah, th that's better. We're going up. And the bottom billion is not. They're they're staying at the, at the same level. So the gap is 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 widening. Um, and there's actually been some research uh, connected to this that you can see that the bottom billion as a whole in the 80s and 90s and even in the uh, the, the the first uh, years in 2000s they were actually losing money and they were going backwards. It wasn't a lot, but still they were going backwards while the rest of the economy in the world was growing by 4%. So the gap is widening. It's, it's getting harder and harder for the other countries, for the bottom billion countries to connect to the global markets. Um, and that is a problem. So globalization itself will not help these countries get out. 
So what will get them out of the bottom billion? Well, the instruments. Aid to the rescue. That's the first one. Um, and in this one, he actually points to Dutch disease again. Um, if, if you send aid into a country, aid will have an economic, uh, economic uh, uh, influence. You know, if you send money into a country and you send people into a country to help the country, uh, though it will help the country, it will also make sure that, you know, money is sent into a country. And there's only so much that, that they can do with the import-export balance. And, and, and well, it, it is a problem in itself. You have to think about these things before you can just go in there and, and pump millions of money, uh, millions of, 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 of dollars into a country in aid because it will erode the demand for their export. So they, they can't produce anything. They don't have to produce anything to sell on the world market to be able to purchase, uh, let's say, a certain knowledge or certain um, uh, healthcare, uh, you know, certain developments. They don't have to because we sent them aid. So it will not help the, uh, the, the industry develop in a country like that if we just send millions of aid. That is going to be a problem. Next to that, aid distribution is a problem as well. A lot of the times, a lot of people that, that give aid, which, you know, I'm, I'm one of myself, I like to see what, what my money does and what, how my money helps some other people. Um, and the problem is that in the bottom billion, you can't a lot of the time. And a lot of the time, the bottom billion countries are dangerous countries to, to be spending your money in because you might actually lose it all. So a lot of the people that give money won't give it to bottom billion countries and why not well because there's a very big chance you will never see anything coming from that money while these are the countries that need it the most they have the hardest time getting aid and there's all kinds of programs actually keeping that going um uh, he actually explains that, you know, the World Bank and the EU and, and uh, UN as well, they all give aid in, in certain ways. But the bottom billion can only get loans. While the richer, well, not really rich, but the, the countries not in the bottom billion can get grants. Well, what, what is, a, is a way to make sure that a country in the bottom billions or a poor person stays poor is give them a loan and make sure they have to repay it with interest. And that is not working as well. So aid distribution is a problem. And we have to look into other ways to distribute aid. So the next trap is military intervention. Well, if you want anything uh, controversial, this is probably your topic. Um, it is very unpopular to talk about this. Even, even just talking about it will get people upset. And of course, in this world, we have seen many examples of military intervention uh, gone wrong. First of all, we didn't intervene in Rwanda, or at least we didn't intervene in time. And that has, um, <laughs> it was a great, a grave mistake. Millions of people died in Rwanda because we were too late to intervene or we intervened in the wrong way. Then we didn't intervene in Yugoslavia as well, or at least in the wrong way, 130,000 people um, and that was Europe, you know, <laughs> and it hasn't been that long ago. Um, at the moment, there are still um, discussions going. What what has gone wrong? What should have? What should we have done better? And, and things like that. So it, it is it is very very bad. We did intervene in Iraq, though you know it might not have been with the right reasons, but we did intervene. It didn't work. Um, and and. These, these things are, are really, really, really bad. Um, but there is a way to intervene military. And uh, Paul, Sir Paul Collier goes into this uh, in, in, in this uh, in this book. And it is, it is really, really interesting. Um, and he points out that not just, just military intervention by itself, but the whole package deal should be, should be thought about. Laws and charters. That's the third instrument that could be used. And um, you could just say, you know, there's there are certain uh, big organizations that have set up certain charters um, and, and certain guidelines to, 
to make sure your money that is, is given as a grant or as a loan that is spent in a right way. And um, it is very impopular to do this, this uh, in, in a country, you know, your country, let's say your country is one of the bottom billion countries and your country wants to develop. Well, what better way to tell, uh, to get all your people uh, going against you is actually say that from, uh, you know, some of the money that you actually get in, you're going to spend in putting up new laws and charters that are going to restrict the, mon the, the, the amount of money spent in your country on certain things that you don't actually need. Well, it is money that is not spent in your economy, whether it's, it's, it's in a corrupt way or not, that money won't go through anymore. So there's a lot of people going, uh, going to go against you because at first, setting up laws and charters is going to hurt your economy, is going to hurt your people, but it will only be a short term thing because it will actually in the long term get your country out. So, uh, but, but really this, this is not really my, my thing. So I, I found this chapter a little hard to, to, to wrap my mind around. And um, it's probably best if you, if you're really interested in this, read it yourself. I'm, I'm not really the one to talk about that because it's, it's um, well, it's something that I have a little trouble with, uh, you know, in, in my mind. The fourth instrument is trade policy for reversing marginalization. And that is something that I really understood as well. Um, you know, trade policy, trade policies we have around the world at the moment. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, some of the par farmers are actually getting um, uh, subsidized money from the EU so that they can sell their products under the price level, under the, 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 the level of production or the level of money they would actually have to get to make a living for themselves. And that will make sure that they can sell it cheap and we can buy it cheap as well. We're actually paying less than that it's worth. We're paying less for our food than it's worth to, um, and that it costs to produce it. And that is actually really unfair. Let's be honest, I, I like it because I can buy my food really cheap, but at the same time, it will make sure that a farmer from one of the bottom billion countries who could actually produce the same goods a lot cheaper than this Dutch farmer, he would be unable to compete because the Dutch farmer is subsidized and he actually gets subsidize, uh, subsidies from, from the EU. He actually gets subsidies from the EU to, uh, to make sure that he can produce goods really, really cheaply. And not just that, that is one of the examples, but there's loads of examples like that. We actually protect our own trade. And at the same time, we enforce trade uh, policies on poorer countries and that's just not working it's it's unfair and it, it, it doesn't really give them a, a chance or an opportunity to actually go into global trade and make a living for themselves so we should be really looking at that and maybe just turning it around making sure that we hurt a little so they get the benefits and that is something that is uh, is talked about in this in this chapter Really interesting chapter. I really thought this was one of the big ways to help uh, help countries develop. Then the last part in the book, the struggle for the bottom billion. Um, it, it sort of is a uh, a call to action, and it really is. You know, if we don't start doing things about getting the bottom billion uh, out of that bottom and get them developing. Uh, you know, their conflicts will spill over to the rest of the world. Um, and that, that is something we're seeing at the moment. Uh, the conflicts in other countries influence not just the neighboring countries, but influence the world. And it will actually be a bad thing for the whole earth if we don't start uh, being serious about developing these countries and helping their people escape poverty because it, it cannot go on like this and this last chapter was really good to um well to call people to to action and to do something and of course it, there is a big question what can you as a person do to go about well making this change well you as a person you just by yourself can't, might not be able to do a lot but still there are things you can do um so in conclusion this is a very interesting book i would recommend it to anyone 
Who is interested in this? I think this book is brilliantly written and several, uh, seldomly have read books that offer such a clear insight on what is happening around the world today. Um, it also doesn't just offer a clear explanation of what is happening, but also tells to a certain extent why it is happening, or why the things we have tried to do about it have so far failed to have the effect we were hoping for it to have. And it also offers some suggestions. Um, I would actually say it's a little stronger than just suggestions as to what can be done to help these countries finally find the way out. And what I've learned from this book is that it's not easy to get poverty out of this world, but it is possible. And at the moment with this channel, of course, as well, but also in my, my, in my personal life, I'm looking at what I can do by myself because I don't believe one person cannot make a difference. I have learned as well that a lot of ways uh, we used to do things in the past are not the ways to actually help the bottom billion countries develop. I highly recommend this book for anyone interested in development, aid, trade and poverty. If you're looking at a way to better the world, this book will be very clear about what not to do and will also give a lot of options about, about what you can do. So if you're interested in this book, use the link below. Um, I've got a link in the description to, that will get you to Amazon and you can purchase the book there. And uh, by purchasing the book via that link, you can also support my channel. If you like this video or have um, any questions, just press the like button or the dislike button if you didn't. Um, if you have questions, just put your questions in the comments below. I will answer uh, all of the questions that are put there. Um, if you like my channel, just feel free to uh, subscribe and also feel free to share this video with as many people as you think is necessary. Uh, because I th really think we can make a difference, uh, but we have to start, we have to do something. So uh, please join me in this effort, um, though, you know, I myself, I'm, I'm pretty clueless at the moment what to do and what step to take next. I think we should start moving. Um, and that is what this book is about. So I really think this is one of the, the best books to start uh, reading if you're interested in this. So get the book and uh, I'll see you later.